Um, my thanks to Chief of uh, International Affairs and Cooperation of Faculty of the SAFA, Ms. Rona Tawi Esfil Ayer. And also I would like to thank Prof. Mirle and Dr. Sanga. Uh, I have the tip from Chief uh, of uh, Office, International Affairs Office to uh, become a uh, moderator now, but I'm really not expert you know, about the uh, philosophy of um, English also about human rights because my subject matter is about uh, religious studies. So uh, maybe some others, our friend, uh, uh, become expert in this topic. But uh, maybe now they have uh, another class or, or another business in another class. So I will uh, do this task or this study from uh, Ms. Rona to get this uh, discussion. Now we have uh, two different topics uh, from two speakers. So, I will divide this uh, discussion into two sessions. First session for Prof. Mary, discuss about human rights, and then uh, including discussion. And, uh, then after that, uh, Dr. Sandra will present about, uh, I think, with this time, thoughts on the uh, picture, so kind of uh, according to the uh, philosophy of the language. So, if we discuss about the human rights, uh, actually in our country, Indonesia, we have uh, still many problems called relating to human rights. Uh, until now, we have problems uh, about the uh, 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 human rights activists like Mr. Munir, also when the old regime, we have uh, many cases uh, human rights activists uh, kidnapping uh, by our government. And also in uh, about the in religious practice, uh, we have also many problems of coding in human rights perspective. Like last week, day we, uh, I asked you, but uh, sorry, I asked uh, Dr. Sandra about the uh, Governor Jakarta case, uh, I hope, when uh, they call him as a, a booster of religion. Uh, this kind of uh, many problems. Uh, according to me, uh, the problem about uh, human rights not only in my country. I think we have also in our universe, uh, including in Europe maybe, also in uh, Africa and also in, uh, I think in uh, Muslim countries like in uh, uh, Arabian countries. So, I think the discussion about the human rights is very important for us in this, uh, in this, uh, this session. Primarily, uh, I will present about uh, human rights. Uh, I think, uh, as far as I know from primarily uh, people, uh, he will discuss about the previous thoughts. And also, with, uh, we, uh, they, uh, sorry, he will give us a spotlight on uh, human rights practice in religious environments uh, aspect. So, so uh, maybe I think I, our audience will uh, listen for or uh, will learn from you about the, how human rights become a good thing for our life. So, uh, thank for you, uh, for me. Uh, it's a project and lesson, uh, and in the second part, we will discuss the uh, coding uh, based on the question from mountains. So, uh, I give you a thank you. Thank you very much for uh, your invitation, um, Professor Shari, yeah. uh, Professor Pana, um, and uh, it uh, was, it is the uh, study.
bezeichnet ist äh, zu Ende, damit der Welt zu very interesting äh, weeks for us here. Um, human rights, it will, uh, of course, it is uh, a very, um, very sensitive topic um, how to implement it. But today I will uh, talk about the foundation of human rights. Um, my research, my research in general concerns um, the, the way to understand the justification of human rights. Uh, human rights are a catalog of different rights, and these various rights um, are considered most of the time in a philosophical perspective as uh, having a foundation and only one foundation. It means that all human rights do have one unique foundation. In my view, it is something that is not that can be uh, valid for the following reason. The list is very diverse and protecting uh, very uh, protecting values fundamental interests of the uh, human beings who have different needs um, and therefore these different needs um, need different measures some measures in turn uh, can uh, protect or promote different fundamental needs of the human beings. Um, and the awareness of these fundamental needs appeared gradually in the uh, history of the human rights, so that it is important to have uh, that in mind. Therefore, I selected uh, different human rights, for instance, the human right to uh, freedom of religion and of conscience, uh, the human right not to be tortured, but also several other rights. Uh, and those rights have, are protecting and promoting different fundamental needs. Uh, they can protect and promote each of them and protect more than one. And uh, all of them are protecting diverse ones. And what I want to show so that I have uh, examples, counter examples, against the basis according to which there is or there should be a unique foundation for all human rights. Uh, an example of this thesis is provided by uh, the book uh, by James Griffin on human rights that uh, has been published now uh, almost 10 years ago. And um, so I take it as a basis and an example of what, in my view, is a wrong view on human rights. And contradicting the general thesis, you um, suffice, it suffices to have uh, one counterexample. I am providing the same several ones, and by doing that, I also try to provide a complex view. Uh, I will present today only the first, most general part, but if you're interested, I could uh, uh, tell you more explanations about especially uh, the foundation of the right to religious freedom, and, uh, the freedom of conscience, and uh, to uh, the prohibition of torture. So, let us begin. I call that in a complicated way, human right not to be free, because this order uh, means that uh, freedom, or more precisely, autonomy is the basis of uh, the foundation of human rights. The preamble of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, 1948, declares the existence of equal and very inalienable rights of all members of the human family. The French Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen, 1789, 
states men are born and remain free and equal in rights. Neither these two declarations of human rights nor any other declaration entails anything defining what a human being is. What is a human being? One can either interpret the absence of this definition in these declarations as relying on a normative assumption or on a descriptive one. Relying on a normative assumption leads to two problems. First, there is no uncontroversial normative definition of what a human being is, or more exactly, should be. So not any normative definition necessarily leads to leaving aside either some human rights or some of their applications. Assuming a descriptive definition of human beings does not lead to these problems and is fully compatible with the entire set of human rights. As for any living being, the human being is defined through its belonging to a species, in this case, the human species. Belonging to a species is not defined by any set of <coughs> capacities to members, but by the capacity of interbreeding and producing fertile offspring that does not necessarily belong to each individual member. Some members may be definitely sterile and have always been sterile, but from which each individual member results. From this, there results that the human rights as a whole, that is, the entire set of human rights, do not protect or promote a certain type of human beings, but under the restrictions made necessary by provisions between human rights, it protects and promotes all kinds of human beings and their fundamental interests at any stage of their life and under any circumstances. In the following, I will criticize one well, of the human rights theories relying on the normative definition of human beings. This theory hopefully comprises the domain of the normative assumption that human beings are those beings who exercise normative freedom. So James Griffin, the author of this theory formulated in this book on human rights, uh, calls the specifically human capacity normative agency. I, Okay. Human rights are protections of our normative agency, the person who accounts for. The first stage consists in our assessing options and thereby forming a conception of a worthwhile life. Not a map of the world of good life, but characteristically peace, more and incomplete ideas about what makes that better worse. That is what I have been calling autonomy. To form and then impose in that conception, we need various kinds of support. I have been calling this minimal provision. And there are not enough for agency if others then if others then stop us. We must also be free to pursue that conception. If I have been calling uh, I have been calling this liberty. All human rights will then come, all human rights will then come under one or other of the three overarching feelings: autonomy, welfare, and liberty. And this Three can be seen as constituting a trial of highest level human rights. And of course, in Griffin's theory, all lower level human rights, that is, the usual list of human rights, are application of the highest level human rights. Prima facie, Griffin's theory of the highest level human rights has two characteristics relevant for the purpose of our uh, present workshop. First, on the one hand, it seems to cover a broad range of human rights because they seem to roughly correspond to one of the classifications of human rights. First, rights to personhood. Second, rights to personal and political freedom. Third, social rights. Admittedly, it leaves aside the group of procedural rights. But the latter group may be part of the lower labels of human rights. On the other hand, Griffin's, uh, Griffin's theory consists of these human rights as providing a certain kind of freedom. Here, I don't mean freedom in its specific sense, as opposed to autonomy and welfare in a more general and vague sense. 
Ce banc Griffith's theory rests on a strong normative assumption, the existence of a capacity of normative agency in human beings who are protected by human rights. One can observe this in Griffin's foundation of the human right that consists in the prohibition of torture. I quote, if we were asked what is wrong about torture, of course the, the, the most obvious thing to say would be that it causes great pain. Our question is, why is torture a matter of human right? And the answer to that couldn't be because it causes great pain. There are many cases of when persons gratuitously inflicting great pain on another that are not a matter of human rights. Torture has characteristic aims. It is used to make someone who can't be the belief, reveal secret, confess crime whether dirty or not, abandon cause or do something else by believing. All of these characteristic purposes involve an unbinding someone else's will. They all involve an attack on normative agency. In the same way, Griffin doesn't ignore that his view on human rights excludes some human beings from the enjoyment of human rights. For instance, such human beings, such human rights as those that are referred to as human dignity, since the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the Basic Law of the Federal Republic of Germany. After having stated that autonomy is a consistent, is a constituent of the dignity of the human person, Griffin draws the conclusion that there are several acceptable uses of dignity not relevant to human rights. For example, the dignity that quite properly should be accorded to a person deep in dementia or to a person that will now, torturing a person with image for sadistic motives doesn't involve an attack on normal agency. Admittedly, briefly, undoubtedly considers torturing a person with dementia for sadistic motives as being morally wrong, but he doesn't consider it as a human rights violation. Now, human rights, including human rights to freedom, as they are in legal practice, as well as in our moral intuitions. Two sources apply not only to the human beings the developed in human agency, but also to those human beings who are either not capable or not able or not willing to develop human agency as understood by Griffin. Let us begin with the case of those people who are not capable or uh, of or not able to develop normative agency and consider Article 5 of the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, um, 1948. No one shall be subjected to torture or to cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment. A significant aspect of the declared purpose of the reform of penal law is higher by the 18th century enlightenment explicitly for the sake of humanity was to prohibit legal punishments that were not useful for the goal of deterrence and therefore cruel. Such punishments were not only medieval criminal proceedings against animals, but also the punishment of young children or of mentally disabled human beings, for instance, of the insane or those with dementia who nowadays are no longer criminally liable. Now the legal punishment of animals, children, and the mentally disabled person did not undermine at all someone else's will, nor did it involve any attack on normative agency. In fact, it was quite the opposite. Normative agency certainly presupposes the ability to be responsible for one's acts, that is, to have the control of one's acts. Illegal punishment of animals, children, and mentally disabled human beings were wrongly assuming the control over one's acts, imputing the responsibility for those acts to these beings. Violating the human rights of children and disabled human beings not to be subjected to cruel, inhuman, or degrading punishment. In their case, any punishment is cruel and inhuman does not amount to an attack 
and their normative agency. Instead, the violation of their human rights consists in attributing them a normative agency which they cannot have. In this case, not normative assumption, normative agency, but the descriptive assumption of the incapability of normative agency is the correct premise of the human right not to be subjected to cruel punishment. Clearly, for these human beings, this human right amounts to a right not to be capable to be free, and to a right to be treated in accordance with uh, this uh, capacity to be free. Although human rights to freedom, if applied to the same kind of human beings, amounts to a right not to be capable to be free. For instance, Article 3 of the um, Universal Declaration of Human Rights disposes everyone has the right to life, liberty, and security of person. A violation of the right to life and security of the mentally disabled and those with dementia is not an attack on the normative agents, and yet the human rights practice is unanimous about considering it a human rights violation. One may object that at least the right to liberty has to be justified by normative agency. Let us take as an example of the right to freedom Article 13 of the Universal Declaration. First, everyone has the right to freedom of movement and residence within the borders of each state. Second, everyone has the right to leave any country in 30 years old and to return to this country. Could a person in charge of the tutelage of a mentally disabled or those with dementia or children, these human beings enjoy freedom of movement, even if neighbors, passengers, or citizens might consider their presence as a disturbance or a burden, and even if the public authority would prefer to segregate them. The same applies for the right of property, etc. The tutelage holders may also use the freedom of assent in order to defend and promote the interests of disabled beings who they take care of. Whereas those with dementia or mentally disabled human beings are not capable of efficiency, children are capable but unable to human efficiency because they didn't learn it yet. Further, human beings are able to possess normative agency so that they are, for instance, criminally liable, but they do not exercise and do not want to exercise normative agency. And still, some human rights not only apply to them, but are also designed for them. Let us consider the case of religious freedom as well as the freedom of conscience and belief of faith. The French Declaration, 1789, formulates religious freedom as a concession. I quote, Article 10, no one may be disturbed for his opinion, even religious ones, provided that their manifestation doesn't trouble the public order established by the law. Why does it use the expression even religious ones? One may refer to Rousseau, who exercised the major influence of the French Revolution that set the Declaration as its own cornerstone. I quote Rousseau, Christianity preaches nothing but servitude and dependence. Its spirit is too favorable to tyranny, for tyranny not always to profit from it. True Christians are made to be slaves. They know it and are hardly moved by it. This brief life has too little value in their eyes. From this statement, we suppose the following consequences of social culture. I quote, there is therefore a purely civil profession of faith, the articles of which it is up to the sovereign to fix, not precisely as dogmas of religion, but as sentiments of sociability. The sovereign may banish from the state anyone who doesn't believe them. Without entering into the specificity of Christianity, or into the critique of Christianity as an alleged religion of slaves, as later authors like Schopenhauer and Fischer also formulated, let us consider the core element of any religion that is not purely civil, as also says. 
any religion rests on some belief on the faith, on something, on, on something subtle as well as on community, on a community worship. What is subtle? Is this compatible with normative agency conceived as Griffith's three highest level human rights? According to Griffith, in the first stage, i.e. autonomy consists in our assessing options and thereby forming the conception of a worthwhile life, not a map of the world of the world of a good life, but characteristically peaceful and incomplete ideas about what makes life better or worse. Now, it is not the free choice of the pious human being that decides what is sacred, although she merely recognizes what is sacred. Many believers and church members describe their belief on the faith as the highest level of conviction, which doesn't result from any higher argumentation or principle. Sacredness is considered to be absolute, and many church members also believe what they, according to themselves, do not understand or find inscrutable. Many church members also obey the rules of their church, even when they disagree with them. Last but not least, religious belief is not necessarily focused on the issue of a worthwhile life for the individual who adheres to it. They may just consist in the adoration and contemplation of the order of the universe in comparison to which their own individual significance is extremely marginal and is the pure abnegation without any hope for salvation. One may object that at least the decision to be in something sacred and to have faith in it originates from the choice. Yet part of the religious belief may consist in the opposite of this thesis. For instance, Martin Luther's notion of Servo arbitrium, uh, which is the basis for the Reformation for all uh, Protestant churches, states that human beings do not acquire their relationship to God as a matter of will, but as God's prison. These aspects of religion may explain the concessive formulation adopted by the French declarations, opinions, even religious ones. Yet, since the French declaration, the content and status of religious freedom has not been abandoned, but widened. I quote, everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religions. This right includes freedom either alone or in community with others, and in public or private to manifest his religion or belief in teaching, practice, worship, and observance. Article 18 of the Universal Declaration. Now, what is conscience? It is moral conscience, understood as a sense of duty run on one's higher moral convictions. These convictions must not rest on rational arguments or consensual evidence. The duty may also be of sacrum or of religious origin. It may also be the Kantian categorical imperative, which commands categorically. Now, according to the personal convictions of the human, of the individual human beings who feel committed to duty, duty often doesn't give a new way to uh, free choice, and it may also oppose to piecemeal and incomplete ideas about what makes life better or worse. That is, to autonomy and moral agency in Griffin's sense. The same applies to the philosophical creed as to the religious belief of faith. In Article 4, the basic law of the federal government. First, freedom of faith and of conscience, and freedom to profess the religious of philosophical creed shall be invaluable. Second, the undisturbed practice of religion shall be guaranteed. Third, no person shall be compelled against his conscience to render military service according to the use of arms. Let us take Schopenhauer's account of poverty. According to this philosophical creed, individual life and individual choice of will is the source of all suffering in the world, and suffering doesn't make any sense. That's Schopenhauer. The moral human being can really suffer who are treason without any own purpose in life. 
autonomy and freedom are undoubtedly values that are incompatible with the Schopenhauer's view and belief, and still human rights protect the Schopenhauerian philosophical creed. For the same reasons, the practice of religion may interfere with the optimal promotion of the minimal conditions of welfare in greater sense. I quote briefly, life itself requires a certain level of wealth, certain physical law, and mental capacities which consist in a certain amount of education. <coughs> but various religious or philosophical convictions preach from renouncing the worldly good, seeking poverty, sometimes also including mental simplicity, etc. Having such kinds of convictions, living according to them, rendering worship to them, and presentizing are all fundamental legal interests that ground human rights, which are not themselves grounded in free choice, but in denial of, the, of free choice. That in no framework for utopia and the uh, declaration of uh, human rights, communities are allowed that have various rules and commandments that clearly suppress any freedom of choice within the community. In Nozick, there are communities of such people as, I quote, proponents of finances, palaces of labor, villages of unity and cooperation, neutralist communities, time stores, Buddhahof, people say, Kundalini, yoga ashrams, and so forth. So many communities where there is a full dedication and unconditional dedication. But it may also be more classically Catholic or Orthodox monasteries, Buddhist monasteries, families, etc. In the expression human rights of freedom, freedom is not meant as being the foundation of human rights, that is, as committing the bearer of human rights that is capable, able, or willing to, have, to behave freely. Instead of this, freedom means that the use of the fundamental legal interests at stake by the bearers of these human rights are free from intervention or violation from either public institutions or physical or legal persons. It is not about the bearers' free choice, but about the bearers' freedom from others. Now, human rights do not protect these fundamental legal interests solely against the interventions by others but also against interventions by the right bearer herself. The right to life doesn't prohibit only homicide by others, but also suicide, and the same of life to mutilation, violating the integrity of the body, and slight enslavement, etc. However, the extent, the extent to which fundamental legal interests are protected against interferences by the bearer herself is not the same as the, extent, as the extent to which they are protected against interferences by others. The right player may consider on behalf herself as God's slave or as subjected to God's commandments, whereas other church members can handle her in this way without her consent. Only the right bearer can consider that she has to accept all dogmas and rituals of her church without any self-examination, just because they are of sacred origin. Yet there is a clear limit to this subjection to God's commandments as well as to duties and beliefs of sacred origin. There is a limit to the human rights to the freedom not to be free. In the case of the human right to religious freedom, it is the following. Everyone has the right, everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. This right includes freedom to change his religion or belief. Considering oneself as God's life, as subjected to as subjected to duties of beliefs of divine or sacred origin. In a situation that one has uh, that one has a human right to terminate at any time without notice and without motivation. It is also the condition set by Nozick for the incompatibility of utopia with 
CV freedom, possibility to live at any time, any community. However, this human right to live any religion, belief or faith at any time, doesn't imply that the adherence to a religion, a belief or faith, initiates in autonomy and free choice. In fact, the latter is not true, as we already saw. In the case of children, who are not able but capable to be free, changes in their statute, for instance concerning their criminal liability, occur when they become able to be free. In the case of human beings who are either mentally disabled or with dementia, the limit is not the termination of the absent exercise of freedom, but the limit set to the powers of their guardians. For instance, the guardian is not allowed to donate all or part of the property owned by a disabled person under their tutelage, even for religious or charity purposes, whereas a mentally able person is allowed to donate their fortune, their entire fortune, at any time. This limits of the rights to, be, uh, to freedom, to the freedom not to be free, should not be confused with the restriction to these rights resulting from the solution found in collisions between either several human rights or several applications of the same human rights. Both the aforementioned limit on those restrictions are obviously valid. I am not denying that some human rights may be partly or even fully grounded on either the moral agency or more likely the autonomy of human beings. There seems to be a paramount example of the latter in Article 5, Paragraph 3 of the Basic Law for the Federal Government Channel. Arts and Sciences, Research and Teaching shall be free. The freedom to teach of teaching <coughs> shall release any person from a alliance to the Constitution. One cannot do research and devote themselves to science without developing autonomous judgment. The following cases are less clear but likely. Article 18, uh, excuse me, Article 19. Everyone has the right to freedom of opinion and expression. This right includes freedom to hold opinions without interference and to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas through any media and regardless of frontiers. French Declaration, Article 11, the free communication of thoughts and of opinions is one of the most precious rights of man. Any citizen thus may speak, write, print, free. What I deny is that all human rights were either partly or fully grounded on either moral agency or autonomy. Now, in which fundamental legal interest can human rights mentioned both be granted in, instead of, of or in addition to autonomy? In the following, I will only sketch some possible foundations for the human rights mentioned both. First, the first fundamental legal interest may be not to suffer in the case of the prohibition of torture. This interest is particularly adequate for grounding the human right not to be tortured, because nearly all human beings, with the exception of dead human bodies and perhaps in some extreme cases of lobotomy, have this fundamental interest, whether they are dementia, our children, our autonomous, etc. Now, of course, the prohibition of torture may serve several fundamental interests, depending on the kind of human beings. In the case of religious freedom, as well as of freedom of conscience, belief and faith, one might argue that religion is considered by some people as being the absolute foundation of everything. And therefore, uh, it, it is constituted for their personality. In this way, the status of a fundamental interest will derive from the condition of some human beings that it is the absolute foundation of everything. This suggestion is strengthened by the fact that in the 20th century, with the expansion of atheism and freedom of thought, and the decline of church membership, freedom of conscience, belief or faith, 
have been added to religious freedom, the result being that only a small minority of people can really assert that they believe in nothing at all, that they do not have any faith and that they do not have any conscience, so that they are not concerned by these freedoms. Another fundamental interest might be that these religious belongings, consciences, beliefs and phrases um, contribute to human diversity and to bearing individual personality. And the latter is in turn considered as a fundamental interest for human beings. Article 2 of the basic law of Germany, uh, of Germany states that every person shall have the right to free development of his person. A further fundamental interest may be not to be dependent, also consider the state to be the solution to the problem of dependence on other individuals, and so traditional religions as an obstacle to this solution. After the experience of the 20th century totalitarianism, the dependence to be remedied was dependence on state ideology and its extremely invasive methods. Human dignity, in turning freedom of touch, religion and belief, has also been introduced in post-war declarations of human rights as an answer to totalitarianism. Um, yet, this foundation is then connected with the fundamental right to have a personality. Not only is autonomy of free choice in briefing sense, not in the fundamental interest grounding all human rights, but at most one among others, but what may inquire whether it is an important fundamental interest of the foundation of human rights, or whether it is merely a marginal one that may be relevant only for a few human rights like freedom of research, freedom of science, freedom of thought. In such a case, confusion of freedom as independence from interference with fundamental legal interests might explain why some authors ground human rights in free choice while not mentioning concrete human rights. In this sense, human rights really guarantee the freedom as a sense from interferences from outside guarantees the freedom not to be free as not exercising one's freedom because of not being capable, able, or willing to exercise and to pay attention. Okay, thank you. No. Mm -hmm. I think uh, very interesting and clear uh, explanation about uh, human rights. So, uh, before we just can give them, uh, give him applause. First. Before I give you a chance to discuss from the audience, uh, I will uh, share about, uh, some notes, but not uh, comprehensively, uh, from uh, uh, probably the uh, lesson just now. Firstly, uh, I agree with him the, the discussion about human rights is a kind of a sensitive thing for us. Then, uh, second, uh, he is that also that we have uh, two problems based on normative assumption. And thirdly, uh, if we discuss about uh, human rights, we will learn, we will know, we will, uh, I think, catch about the three keywords, three keywords, firstly autonomy, welfare, and liberty. Fourthly, I agree with him uh, when he probably said that uh, men, uh, freedom is not opposed to autonomy and welfare. I agree with him, uh, especially for me. Uh, fifth, uh, fifthly, uh, for me, I think uh, interesting uh, statement from uh, James Griffin, uh, as a quote, Mr. Berry, that uh, I think uh, in uh, page three, yeah, it's, uh, in page three we know that uh, in critical theory uh, said that yeah, okay. 
very sorry. Okay. In in the last uh, in the last uh, in the last paragraph from uh, from many uh, people that driven state and uh, driven and justly considered torturing a person with dementia for sadistic motive as being morally wrong, but he does not consider consider it as a human rights uh, violation. I think uh, this statement is interesting to me or to us uh, to discuss it more. And uh, fifthly, uh, when um, Frank Bailey discussed about uh, human rights, human rights in uh, freedom uh, in the case of the freedom of or case of religious freedom, uh, he uh, discuss uh, more. Uh, I think in the, in, in uh, deeply and also what about the, the French Declaration, also Universal uh, Declaration of Human Rights, also uh, what or discuss with uh, Nozick and uh, Schopenhauer.